people back when I was growing up. We could do that and about that fast too. Amen. So I appreciate Angela putting those slides together for her. I tell her to tone that one down just a hair next time. But anyway, I'm going to ask Cheryl to come on up. And uh, I'm looking forward to what God's Word's got to say, okay? She's, she's getting, she's digging. But I appreciate y'all being here. And y'all just listen to what God's Word's got to say. Good morning, everyone. We've been uh, in our... Um in our uh, study of the scriptures, we've been doing psalms, and uh, it's just been so exciting to, to read some of the prophetic um, psalms, especially from going through what we've been going through with Pastor Al, and he's done such a wonderful job, I think, of making um, the end times exciting and joyful instead of hearing about all the plagues and the sadness that sometimes people emphasize. And uh, I just wanted to read um, just a couple verses. Uh, Psalm 46 is uh, a very, very, you don't have to turn to it or anything, but it's just a very uplifting psalm, very triumphant. And, uh, oh, sorry. That's better. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear me better. But in, in Psalm 46, uh, at the end of the, Psalm, it says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And then uh, I looked in Isaiah chapter 2. He's saying, in the last days. And then the verse I wanted to read is, uh, okay, here it says, um, the eyes of the arrogant man will be humbled and the pride of men brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And I just think that is, that's just so exciting. It just blows my mind. And um, so I want to read these uh, words that Pastor Al, these verses that Pastor Al gave me, if you want to stand for the reading of the word. And it goes really well with this too. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I'm alive ever, forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands, lampstands are the seven churches. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. Oh, Lord, you teach us so much, and you give us hope, you give us encouragement, you direct our paths, you teach us to do right, and avoid wrong. There's just so many blessings in your scripture. But the biggest thing that we learn in your scripture is who you are. Amen. And we learn about you. And we grow closer to you. And Lord, today as Pastor Al uses the scriptures to teach us, we pray that we would learn more and listen and really grasp who you are mm -hmm. and what you're doing. That we would draw closer to you throughout it. And I pray for Pastor Al that he, too, would grow closer to you as he studies your word. Amen. And that you bless his time this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have enjoyed getting into the revelation of Jesus Christ. Have you? Amen. I believe that... I have a new fervor. I have a new desire. And as Cheryl said, I believe that so many times we have learned that the revelation is so, as one of the, the Greek words, apocalyptic, okay? and But we put apocalypse instead of just the unveiling is what it means or the uncovering or the showing. 
Uh, we put the gloom and doom of the zombies and all the dead and all the problems that go with it. But I appreciate what Cheryl said, and I'm glad somebody has seen this. Is I, I believe that the book of Revelation for the, the bride of Christ is an exciting book. Amen. Amen? All the terrible, bad things that go on in the book of Revelation, we're not going to be here if you're a child of God. Amen? We're going to be having a time. We've got an award ceremony to go to and a big old banquet, and then we're going down to the stables and getting us a white horse. Amen? And we're going to come back with Jesus. We don't have to fight neither. He's going to take care of all of it. We just get to come with him. Amen? And then he's going to set up a kingdom to rule and reign for 10... Or, uh, 10,000 years. I get it right here. 1,000 years. And then, after that, he's going to crush all the clocks and we're going to live for eternity with him. Isn't that exciting? That's a nutshell. But here's what I want us to get today. We've talked over the last few weeks. We, we've learned that to read the book of Revelation, and that's what I'm trying to do right now, is that we have to have the right frame of mind. Where is it that you are in your faith? Are you a believer that Jesus is the Son of God? He died on the cross. He washes our sins away. If we accept that free gift of salvation, we become His child. He indwells us. It's a happy book. Amen? So we need to read it with enthusiasm, with excitement. That's the reason why He said, whoever reads this book aloud will be blessed. Amen? If we know what the meaning is, we know who the, the Lord is and He's coming back to get us. And then we... We talked about the great I Am. And we talked about Him as uh, the triune God, the King and Savior, the Judge and the Almighty, and how it's an eternal thing and that, that He includes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all these things to help us to understand that He has made a way for us to become His bride. I believe that's exciting. And that's the reason why I've been using I Am in a lot of my devotionals and some of the words that we have that presence that we we look for and all these other things that we've talked about this last week during if you're missing a word with pastor al you're missing a lot of the the meat and potatoes that i do during the week from my, my sermons okay so i ask that you do that and i know i say that now that i'm going to be gone a week okay but when i get back get back into it please uh and then last week we saw a snapshot of where Jesus is and what he's doing right now for you and me as the bride of Christ. He's in the holy place. And the big thing was that we saw that he is doing everything in his power to make sure that we, John, you as an individual, me as an individual, but then the church as a whole, we make a bright light. And Friday, if you didn't get to see it, I talked about the glory of God and how he's given us that responsibility to shine for him. And that's what he's doing. He's making sure that we're, our lamps are bright and they're doing the things that we should. So that's the reason why John finds him in the holy place, and that is why he's there. He's taking care of us. And I also brought out that because of that, we become priests. Amen. I said that this week, and we're able to go into the Holy of Holies. That's the reason why the scripture says we can come boldly to the throne. Amen. Isn't that cool that he has done that for us? But with all this, we see John walk into the holy place. And that's where we pick up today. He has seen Jesus. He's heard the voice. And he has turned to see who it is that he has seen and heard, peripheral if you will. But what does the scripture say that he does? When he saw him, I, f I fell at his feet as though dead as though dead. I believe that John, we know that he was very familiar with Jesus. He probably recognized the voice that he heard. He also, as he turned, he had seen Jesus in his glorified body. There on the mountain of transfiguration. If you recall, he wanted to set up uh, James, Peter were with him and they wanted to make three tabernacles because there were two there with him, right? And there's, John knew who this was. Can you imagine? John was an old man. He was an older man. Um, but he fell as though dead. And that struck me. And it makes me wonder if, well, was I doing something wrong? He was on the Isle of Patmos. He was 
remember when Jesus, when, when the angel came, where was he at? He was in church, right? He was in the spirit. But he fell as dead. And that, like I said, that struck me. But Jesus walks up and it says, but he laid his hand on me saying, fear not. How many times in the New Testament does Jesus say, fear not? How many times in the Old Testament does he say, fear not? The magnificent glorified picture of Jesus is enough to make us fall down. Amen? But I, I, it just struck me as, as dead, petrified, um, not knowing. And I believe that we can grow from this. And my question for us today, everybody got a handout? Amen. I pray you did. I never did send the notes out online, baby. Just help me remember that. Um, I want us to consider this. Do you fear the glorified Jesus of Revelation? Do you fear the glorified Jesus of Revelation? Remember, the whole book of Revelation is the agenda in which God has told Jesus. You remember, God told Jesus, Jesus told an angel, the angel told John, and then he tells, John tells who? The church, us, okay? It's a message, it's an agenda, but what the world has changed this whole book about is destruction. Amen? Not only the destruction of the world as far as man versus man and then God versus man, but many people, when you hear the book of Revelation, they don't think about the church. They don't think about what, has, what we have to look forward to. And another thing is these first few chapters of the Revelation are about today. They are still taking place in the church age. And a lot of people think that this is all about another time. We haven't got there yet. But this is actually today. So the verses in the, 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 this message today is for today, September the 13th, 2020. You can take the words that God has put in His Word in these verses, in this chapter, you take them to the bank, okay? They're happening today. So I want to encourage you with the message today. And we've tried to do that. I myself, I've gained a new fear and respect for the Jesus of Revelation. I say fear and respect because I'm looking at things in light of the things of this world. It makes me think, hey, it could be any moment. He's always told us to be ready. But with the world self-destructing like it is, it may and I keep looking to the eastern sky, don't you? And I believe that it's something we need to think about and be more uh, uh, respectful, but even with fear. The fear part that I have is, have I done everything that he's asked me to do? Because he's going to ask us when we get to the Bema seat, what would you do with this? And we're going to have to give an account. Amen? But see, the, the whole thing is that I want us to understand that today, you know, that fear and respect that we have, Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. We've all heard that, right? It says, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Isn't it good to know a little bit about your groom? If you're a bride, don't you want to know about the groom? He already knows what we're doing. He's there in the holy place. Jesus is taking care of us. He's, he's doing everything he can. And I believe that we need to understand that the things that we read today in this chapter are for us the church, the bride. I believe he's starting to show his glory to us. He's always done that. But I believe it's starting to permeate. Is that a good word? That as we understand and learn more about Jesus, we're able to glow like Jesus and share his Holy Spirit with others that do not know the Holy Spirit. They don't have that glow. You know, I say, they, they, we, I want to be a Christian so they'll look at me and say, I want what they've got. What have I got that they don't have? The Holy Spirit, right? And because of that knowledge and the ability to be respectful in fear, we can also react like John. It was genuine. He fell down as dead. And he's, he's still stuttering. If, if you, if you, my, my imagination goes, he still just can't get over that God has visited him. He probably thinks, like I said, he's, he's fixing to die. God's just going to take him to heaven. 
But we got to have a better attention and a better purpose for what we're doing right now. We have to look at him as our glorified high priest as we talked about last week. I don't want us to be crippled though. I don't want us to fall down as dead. When Jesus show up, I want to say, Hallelujah. Here I am. Thank you. You know, we, we, we sing that song, I can only imagine. And I can. I can only imagine. I might just shut up. Y'all say that'll be a first. But I look forward to seeing my Savior. I look forward to seeing Jesus, the great I am. And I believe that he, as he told John that day, he says, fear not. And that's where I got the title for my sermon, Fear Not. But my first point is, fear not because I am. The person, the triune God, I am, that we talked about two weeks ago. I can live life today without fear because I know who I am is. Amen? We have the Father. We have the Son. But yet here's the most important to us, and we have the Holy Spirit. God, the I am, lives within us and we are his children. And, and we talked briefly about it last week, but John 17, Jesus prays. He says, as you and I are one, let them and us be one. Through the Holy Spirit, we become part of that circle. And I believe that is the reason why we have this comfort for today. The verse there in verse 17 and 18, he says, I am the first and the last and the living one the Alpha and the Omega, the A to Z and everything in between. I am He. I am. And I believe, I'm not going to go back and re, re, review all those things, but the great, great I Am wants you to feel His presence. I talked about that Thursday. He wants us, or I, I meant Wednesday it was. He wants us to feel His presence because He wants us to partner with Him to show His glory. He wants us to feel His presence presence so that we can live in this time in 2020 with COVID-19 with I don't know if you're following the other things in the world there's a lot of crazy stuff going on there's a fight going on in Syria right now that's of biblical proportion that will have an impact on the tribulation there's some things going on in India that will have a biblical impact on the prophecies of things that will happen during the tribulation there are things going on all around the world. If you go back to the minor prophets and the major prophets and you start looking at the things that they talked about that have yet to happen, that have impact on the tribulation, the great tribulation that is going to be talked about here in a few, it's probably going to be months before we get to those. But here's the thing. We don't have to fear because the great I am has included us. Would you agree with that? Amen. He holds our hand. I'm glad that he holds our hand. Have you ever had a child and you say, now you hold on to my hand. We watch Eliana, uh, Judy's little little young and she, we've been watching her since she was about six weeks old. Probably about six weeks, thereabouts. She just turned four. She tells me all the time she's four. She's not a little girl no more. But I say, hold my finger. And Judy does too. And we always tell them, hold my hand. How many of y'all have done that with your youngins? You go into a store, you say, hold my hand. Amen. And the thing about it, but if they get away and they go on their own, have you ever just stood back and watched them? They're all about whatever they were going to do. And then they notice, where's mama? Where's daddy? And then the, the waterworks start. And then you hear that, why? Have you ever felt like that as a Christian? You've yanked your hand out of Jesus' hand and then you find yourself in this big world. You say, I need my Jesus. I hope you feel that way. I know I do. See, Isaiah 41.10, we've said it the last two weeks and I thought it was good to repeat again this week. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will keep you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand he holds us he, he, he wants to hold your hand but you've got to keep your hand in his he cares for you just like you do your children he cares for you remember we are the bride of Christ he loves us he's going to spend eternity with us 1 Peter 5 7 casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you Judy wants something I can tell when she just wants some or if 
she really needs something. Amen? And if she says it in the way that, that we should pray to our, our, our great I am, we know they'll be taken care of. Didn't Jesus say, whatever you ask in my name, what? You got it. And he takes care of us. He says, cast all your anxieties. We, we got a lot of things to be anxious about these days. Amen. I pray that you ask and understand that the great I am cares for you. And then he gives you strength and courage. I preached a whole message, a whole series on this. Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you? It's not a matter of him telling us what to do. It's, hey, I fear not because I'm here. I want you to be strong and courageous. Amen? You have the great I am on your side. You can do that. Be not frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Have you ever been that place in life where you just says, oh, what am I going to do? Everything's gloom and doom. I can't do nothing right. And Jesus is just right there. Here I am. You just got to ask me. Lean on me. Get up in my lap. Those are the things that we have to understand and we have to understand that he, we don't have to fear because of the great I am. He'll comfort your heart through the scripture. He'll comfort your heart. If people was to be more uh, uh, unified with the body here, the church, we could help and comfort one another and we do that quite often. I believe we need to understand that Jesus through the Holy Spirit can give us that strength and courage and he's always with you. He's always with you. We think of the, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It says, And Jesus came and said unto them, I can't wait to get back to our Wednesday nights when we get back into this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Amen? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The great I am, will you? Isn't that what it says? And it says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And then it goes on with the promise. And behold, I am with you. Not just today, not just when you're out making disciples, not when you're living life, but it says to the end of the age. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we're at the end of the age. Amen. Some of y'all might be a little closer than us. Amen? Amen? We don't know when we will get to meet our Savior face to face. It could be today. Hallelujah. I can't wait to see Jesus face to face. I'm not worried about that mansion. I'm not worried about the streets of gold. I want to see the great I am. I want to see his face, the one who died for me, the one who gave his life that I might live that wants to live with me the rest of his eternity. Hallelujah. That's something that ought to make you happy right there. Make you jump up and down. Point number two, fear not because I am holds the keys. I am holds the keys. Now think about that. Whoever holds the keys can get into everything, knows where everything's at. Amen. He's the one that you go to to get into different places. Have you ever been in a plant or a work? I used to work at a, I was a maintenance man. And I not only had a wad of keys in my pocket, well, this, this is just my church keys. I have them on a separate ring than what I keep my car keys and house keys and stuff on. This is just the doors here. And this ain't all of them. I got another one that's probably bigger than this in my desk drawer. Jesus, the great I am, holds all the keys. He can get through any door in your life. He can get through any door in my life. He can get in them doors you don't want him to get into. Write that one down and remember it. Because a lot of you think you can keep things from Jesus. I used to think I could. I just won't say nothing. I'll just do this my way. But what did John say? He sat there and he says, I, I, Jesus told John this. He says, I died and behold, I, I, I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and Hades. This verse gives us comfort for eternity. Comfort for eternity. I believe that in we read this as he's laid it out and as we saw earlier that he's the beginning and the last and he's the Alpha and the Omega and we'll see that throughout the book of Revelation. But I believe it gives us 
a, a glimpse into eternity past. Eternity past. If you was to lay out a timeline, you'd have to draw a line and put an arrow on both ends of the line because we don't know where they actually start nor end, okay? Eternity goes both ways as far as you can imagine, okay? There's no end to it. And we have to understand that our eternity past, what did he do? The great I am. He held the keys. What did he do with those keys? He redeemed us. Amen? He gave us our eternal life. In Isaiah 53, and the Isaiah 53, is he, he, he tells this story in Isaiah 53, is a very vivid picture of Jesus and what he did for us. Amen? It says, Surely... He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet he esteemed him, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. He received our wrath from God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. You can fear not. Your past is under the blood. Amen. And it says, and with his wounds, we are healed. So if we look at eternity past, great I am has the keys. He's opened all those doors that you don't want him to open half the time. And he's seen our lives. And if we sit there and say, Lord, I'm sorry, guess what he does? He washes them away. He takes care of us because of his torment on the cross of Calvary. He has washed our sins away if we accept that free gift of salvation. He has redeemed us. He has paid the price. He has covered our sins and washed them away that we can stand before the great God the Father because He cannot stand sin. And we should hate it just as much as He does. And then He has given us victory over death. Amen? That is eternity future. I don't worry about dying. Do you? Some of you do. I know a lot of people that are scared to death to die. Amen? I, I, I worry more about how I'm going to go. Amen? I'm allergic to pain, okay? That's the only thing I'm anxious about. I've asked him, let me just go to sleep and just not wake up until I see his eyes. Amen? But here's the thing. He, has, he gives us the victory over eternity future. And we can see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, death is swallowed up in victory. See, the death has no victory over us. Jesus took care of that death because he, he died on the cross. Three days later, what did he do? He got up out of that grave, right? How did he get up out of the grave? The Holy Spirit. Who indwells you? The Holy Spirit. That gives us eternal life. We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to worry about eternity, future, because he has promised us that he will raise us. Amen? Hallelujah. I fear not. Amen. But then there is, he will give us comfort. And today, now I told you that eternity past, eternity future, today is a dot on that timeline. Today, September the 13th, 2020, amen? We can look at any timeline and there is a reference in which you are interested in and that, in our case, this is what it is. In Psalm 23, we all know this 23rd Psalm, but it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. We're a child of God. He's taking care of us. He says, Fear not. I hold the keys. He says, I, You are with he, he, He's with us. We've already stated that. His rod and His staff, He comforts me. I always thought about that rod and staff. My dad liked to beat me with a rod. And Jesus does too for me every once in a while. Y'all heard me say he takes me to the woodshed? That's when he's trimming that light. He wants to make me brighter. Don't take it as, as something that you're being disciplined all the time. That's the reason why everybody hates the book of Revelation because it's about discipline in certain areas. But as a bride, he comforts us with that rod and staff. He keeps us in his close proximity. That's a shepherd's job. He keeps the sheep in his close proximity so that he can take care of them. Amen? The valley of the shadow of death, even if Jesus heals us, the Holy Spirit heals us through death, you know, sometimes that's the answer to our prayers. Please heal, heal them. I've seen people suffer for months, if not years. I had a little, little lady in Florida, Miss Nettie, 
And she couldn't eat and she couldn't do a lot of things. And she was saying, Lord, why is he leaving me here? I said, to keep me going. And when she got ready to go and she says, I'm ready to go. And I prayed with her many times. Lord, just go ahead and take Miss Nettie. She's ready to go. But you see, that's the answer to prayer. We lay down this old sin-filled carcass, this jar of clay. We lay it down and guess what? We're in the presence of our Lord and Savior. Isn't that what Paul said? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. See, we, can, we don't have to fear those things because he has told us he would be with us. Point number three. Fear not because I am knows all. I am knows all. It's not just about the keys getting into those things. It's not just about having the authority to go into any space or know all things. That's the reason why I love having a God like we do. He's omnipresent, omniscient. He knows everything, and that's what we're talking about right now. He knows what you're going to do tomorrow. He knows what you're going to do in a week. He knows what date you're going home. Amen? And that's the reason why we need to put our focus on that and say, I don't have to worry about it because he holds the calendar. Okay? It gives us comfort about the unknown. If you can't do anything about it, why worry about it? That used to be our saying. When we closed the hatch on that submarine and we went underwater, I used to mess with people. They, they, it'd be their first patrol out at sea. And I was in charge of the torpedo room. And one of the pens that we got was our dolphins. And they, would, they had to learn every compartment. So if we had a problem, a fire, flooding, or whatever, you could help out to fight the casualty. But I used to have a lot of fun with these new kids. I was a kid myself. I wasn't but 20-something. But this 17-year-old, 18-year-old, never been away from home. He's in this big steel tube we call a submarine. He's sitting up in the torpedo room in between two torpedoes that are pretty big and there's an escape trunk right there in my torpedo room and I was in charge of it and I always made sure I had a big audience up there and there was a preventive maintenance thing that I had to do. I had to actually go into the escape trunk and that meant you had to open that hatch and they didn't know the escape trunk was there. And I'd barge into the torpedo room. I've had it. I just can't stand this anymore. I, I'm done. And I'd climb up that ladder and start opening that hatch. And them kids would just look. They didn't know. I knew there was nothing there to worry about. But then when I opened that hatch and water didn't come in, if, at 400 feet you can't open a hatch with all that water pressure anyway. But them kids didn't know that. And that's the exact same way we need to be with our lives. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Amen? Stop worrying about it. Fear not. He took care of your past, didn't he? He'll take care of your future. Stop worrying about what you don't know. Now what Jesus did, he says, write, there, uh, write therefore the things that you have seen. Okay? This is where John starts being that stenographer that we talked about last week. Okay? And he goes on, he says, those that are and those that are to take place after this. You see, he already knew what you've already seen. John had already walked with Jesus for three years. He trusted Jesus. He knew Jesus. He knew he was the Son of God. Do you? Do you trust him enough with your never-dying soul? Trust him with you tomorrow. Amen? That's what he said, and the things that are, not, that are to take place. Now, John's going to paint a real bad picture here, and we're going to get to that eventually. But as the bride of Christ, we know that we're going to be able to go to heaven and be with Jesus. He knows what's going to happen. And we need to put our focus on that. He has a limited, he has limited, well, here's one way that we can do it in some of the songs that we had today. He limits what man can do to you. We read the book of Job. And Satan wanted to do this. He said, hey, you let me touch him. You let me, you know, God told him, he says, have you considered my servant Job he says, you can do whatever you want, just don't touch his body. And he went and he killed his family and done all this stuff. He says, oh, well, it's no wonder. You've, you've protected him. Let me touch his body. He said, okay, you can touch his body, but you can't kill him. You see how the progression goes? It's like he has to go to God and say, may I? Amen. God's never going to allow you to go through what you can't handle. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, there's no temptation that has taken us, but such is common to man. 
But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. But will with the temptation what? Make a way of escape. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. We need to understand that. And we need to go to him and understand that he is limited. Man is limited to what he can do for us. In Psalm 118 verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? We quoted that in our psalm today. What can man do to me that God has not allowed him to do? We can have that peace. He's offered us, he's offered, now get this, he's offered you peace. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Doesn't matter what comes my way. If I'm in the hand of the great I am, I don't have to worry about it. Amen. I wish we could get that. When we start worrying about the bills, I've sat down on many a time, and there'd be a whole lot more a month at the end of the money. And I would sit there and say, how am I going to do this? Because I had tithed at the beginning of the month and because I had done everything that God had asked me to do with the finances, you know what? I've got a real good credit score. Not bragging about that. But because I pay my bills and everything, God, and I can only give it to God. There were several years here at this church that first year, first two years. There was many times I sat down and prayed, Lord, you're going to have to intervene. You know what? He'd give me a gift or he'd give me a job. And my bills were always taken care of. I didn't miss a, I have yet to miss a bill in New Mexico. And that's by the grace of God because he knows what I'm coming up with. He says, don't worry about it. I got you a job lined up. And sure enough, somebody called me up. I need you to retile my bathroom or something like that. And I don't do all that nowadays. Y'all pay me enough now. I don't have to do all that. But here's the thing. God always took care of me. He always gave me. I shouldn't be anxious about it because he's going to take care of me. And he then he's also not only just offered the peace for me, but he's offered to help me. He's back in the back back here. Enrique, he's translating for me and everything. But the other day he came over, he helped me put some flooring down. I said, before we pr uh, get to doing this floor, let's pray. I said, it's just a habit before I start any job, I pray. What was Jesus while he was on this earth as a young man? He was a carpenter, amen. He was a handyman. And I'm doing handyman work. I said, Lord, I need some more help here. And he'd give me knowledge and we work things out. I ask him to help me and that's what we can do because of the great I am. We don't have to fear because he knows all. And he wants to help us in Isaiah 41 verse 13. For, lo, for, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. We've already seen that, right? It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. He's the one that helps us when we have questions. He's the one that helps us when we have troubles. He's the one that helps us when we can't help ourselves. Hallelujah. I'm glad he's there to help me. Why I would ever want to snatch my hand out of his hand, I don't know. But there's a lot of people that will not accept his help. He knows all. Let's not fear, okay? Point number four. Point number four. Fear not because I am cares for his bride. John, I love you, but I love Miss Judy more. Does that make sense to y'all? I love John. I love Andy. Andy's one of my best friends, but I love Miss Judy more. Why? She's my bride. Have you ever thought about you are the bride of Jesus? Why? Why we worry about so much when we know that we're his bride and we, we take that away from him? We shouldn't fear because he cares and loves his bride very much. And that's the reason why verse 20 stands out. And this is, and we'll get into it, but anyway, the verse says this, As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, I love it when Jesus tells what he means. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. 
Now, we're going to get into that a little bit more as we go along, especially when we get to the churches. But I want to resolve this seven-star thing. Um, maybe not resolve it, but give you where I, I feel and what I think, okay? And I'm going to give you Scripture to back up two different ideas, okay? But this whole thing, verse 20, gives us the understanding that he cares for his bride because it gives us comfort and pr through protection. We've already talked that he... He takes care of us in whatever we're doing, wherever we're going. He has the keys and he knows everything that's going on. But this verse here, and it's when you when you go to theologians and people that have written commentaries and there's a dispute between two of your favorites, you have to sit there and say, okay, let's hear both arguments and let the Holy Spirit lead. Okay, and that's what I've done. And I believe that we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. Just as the man who wrote the scripture we, they relied on the Holy Spirit to give them the words to write, correct? We have that same Holy Spirit that will help us understand. That's the reason why these verses, I'm going to give you the verses that I have so that you can make your own decision. And I'm leaning toward one or the, one or the other, and I'll tell you that. But the seven stars, let's look at on the premise of a guardian angel. Guardian angels, we talked about them back when we talked about different kinds of angels. Matthew 18.10 says, See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels also see the face of my Father who is in heaven. We have guardian angels, okay? I used to not believe that till I read that verse. And it might just be children because that's all it references here is children. Now we are the children of God. So there's a possibility that this is a who he's talking about. And I like, as a preacher, I like to think that we have a guardian angel over this church. And I, sometimes I think there is one because it sure has turned out okay on some cases I didn't think it would. And there's been some times that I was grateful that maybe there is a significant holy being that has some mediation between us. But see, where my problem starts happening there is we have one mediator, and it says one mediator between man and God. And who is that? Jesus. Amen? So the other, and the one that I like, and you may not, you may say this is prideful. No, it adds a whole lot of burden to my shoulder, and that is that that angel is the preacher. That angel is the preacher, the one that God has placed here. I didn't show up one day and say, I'm going to be your preacher. It was a process that we, I went through. I allowed the church elders and those that were on the search committee to ask me questions. And they asked some good questions. There were some questions I didn't understand why they were asking. But anyway, there was a lot of biblical questions that they asked me that were very important that made sure that they knew that, one, hopefully that they were asking me these questions so they knew that I was a man of God, believed God's Word, believed the Holy Spirit, believed there's a heaven. That's amazing that you have to ask that question nowadays. Believe that there's a hell and that Jesus is going to come and get us one day. There's a lot of questions that the preachers are asked. I don't just come up and say, okay, I'll fill your position. I'm only going to want this month, each month, blah, blah, blah. It's not a business contract. Somebody asked me after Judy's mom passed, well, are you all going to leave now? I said, well, I don't know. I said, I work for a higher authority than, than my wife. I work for a higher authority than man. And when, jo when God moves, then that's when we'll move, Okay. You'll know it before I do, probably. But the problem is, is that we have lost track of what the preacher's job is. I'm not saying this prideful, and as I said, that puts a whole lot more responsibility on me. Uh, I'm a man, just a human being, just like you. I have needs. I do have, have committed sin. I try not to. I probably work harder at it than some do. But here's the thing. I will give an account for how I took care of this flock. Amen? I will take, I'll have to give an account for how I preached to you. 
Did I give you the word? Did I give you enough evidence for you to make up your own mind? I've told you, when I get done preaching, you go to the word and you study it yourself. You listen to the Holy Spirit. But God needs a shepherd and God needs somebody on the mouthpiece. I sometimes bring up questions. I've, I've seen people and I've had people say, you caused me to have more questions than, I, than, than you give me answers. Sometimes that's what we need to do. That's that, that rod and staff. And uh, Paul talked about a goat at one point, somebody that pokes. But here's what I believe, and I believe that the preacher is because Jeremiah 3.15 it says, And I will give you shepherds over my, after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's a job of a preacher. Hebrews 13.17 Obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. I'll have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. I will have to give an account. And I believe that you as a child of God and this church as the bride of Christ, that we have to have the Holy Spirit and then it's my job is to, it's not to tell you definitely yes or no on different things. It's to give you enough information and to give you that ability to talk to God yourself, to feed yourself, and to nurture you. And what was Jesus doing in the holy place? He was making sure that light was bright. And what was the lampstands? As we saw, it's the seven churches. We'll get more into that, but it's the church. The connection between God and us as a church is the Holy Spirit. But I spend more time. You would be surprised how many hours it took me to get these four little pages. You'd be surprised how many times I wadded this up and started over. And here's the reason being is I want to make sure it's right. I want to make sure you're fed with what God would have you to do. So what I believe, I think I've told you, the light in the next, in light of the next two chapters, and we will see that when he starts talking to the church, he talks to the angel. He says, send it to the address of the angel of the church of Ephesus. Well, angels don't have addresses the last I saw, okay? But anyway, in light of the next two chapters, um, every local church, I like, like I talked about, they could have a guardian angel. Uh, we've seen the interpretation angel in several verses. There's another 7 to 12 times that the word angel is translated in the original text as messenger. I give a message. Amen. Amen. I bring a message to you. God lays it on my heart. He gives me the scripture to give you. I bring a message. I believe they are the pastors of the seven churches and the symbolized, that are symbolized by the uh, lampstand. John's vision shows us that each pastor is being held in the Lord's right hand. There have been times I want to move in a direction, but I just don't have peace. There have been times I want to preach something else, and I don't have peace. And this is the only explanation that I can give for the troubles and the discomfort that I have when I go in a different direction than what the Holy Spirit's leading me. Because God has his preachers in his right hand. He can pull them. He can do whatever he needs. If I, and I've told you, if I start preaching some other than God's word, you need to get rid of me. Amen? I'll tell you that. But you know what? If I start doing that, God will take care of me. All right? I've seen some preachers die in the pulpit. Heard of them. I've seen some other preachers that are taking a stand. What about John MacArthur? He's being fined $1,000 every meeting right now in California. There's another church. They're being fined 50000 a week. That's hard. They started laying those kind of fines on us. We'd be in trouble. But they're standing for God. The preacher has to make that decision to move forward. So let, I, I'd like to look at it. It's the, the, the angel is the preacher. The angel is that one that's there because Jesus is jealous of his bride. I'm going to move forward. I've said enough on that. Look at those verses and make your own decision, okay? I believe it's the preacher. 
And we'll, I'll prove it even more later. But because of these angels, these messengers, it shows us just how much the great I Am loves His bride. He wants you to have everything you need. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 says, For I feel a divine jealousy for you. Jesus is jealous over you. Isn't that cool? If the world starts messing with you, maybe that angel needs to come up and say, Hey, I see you've been doing this. And I've not had to do that. We've not had church discipline anybody in here. But here's, here's the thing. We, God has placed those angels here to give us the understanding that God is jealous over you. We're not going to get caught up in the traditions of the world. We're going to do what God's Word says. And we're going to keep the faith. Amen. And we're going to keep doing it the way God wants us to do. And I know we're going into overtime, but I think we need this. I love you, but Jesus loves you more. Amen. My daughter, I said, who loves you? She said, Jesus. I was wanting her to say, Daddy. But anyway, Jesus loves you more than anybody will ever do. Jesus loves Helen more than Tony does. Jesus loves Gavin more than Miss Pauline does. That's hard to believe. And he's jealous over you. He wants you to have everything you need. He says, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Jesus has gave us the understanding that we are his bride. And because of the great I am, we know that he loves his bride. So I asked you a while ago, do you fear the glorified Jesus of Revelation? There's a lot of people that are afraid of this Jesus. There are a lot of people that are afraid of what God's going to do. That's why they want to know when the last day is so they can live like the devil up to the week before and then they can get right with God. That ain't how it goes, is it? It says always be ready. But you see, the thing is, is we don't have to look at him and be able to fall dead because of our fear that he is going to discipline us. Our sins have been paid for. Our sins have been taken care of if you've accepted the free gift of salvation. Through grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. So when John fell as dead, my conclusion is I want us to fall at the high priest's feet as alive. Living as the bride alive doing and worshiping the glorified Jesus. He's doing a job right now, today. He is our high priest. He's standing in the holy place. He's trimming the wicks on the candles. He's adding oil, the Holy Spirit. He's given us those angels to take care of us, to lead us in the direction in which he wants us to be. You know, it's, God doesn't want you to suffer unless you need to suffer. Sometimes we suffer, and we were reading it in Cheryl's uh, explanation of the psalm that we read the, today. Sometimes it's just a matter of God wants you to get to a place that you rely on Him. You've taken your eye off your first love. We'll get into that on one of the churches. But we need to fall down. Thank you. You've loved me. You made a way for me to be here. When I see Jesus, that's what I want to do. Just take it in. Just love Him. I hope that's how you see it. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings. You've given us everything we need. You've taken care of everything. We don't have to worry about death. We don't have to worry about the grave. We don't have to worry about our past. We don't have to worry about the future. Oh, Lord, all we want to do is see you, to love on you, to worship you. Lord, let us feel the love that you have for us and how you have glorified us as your children, as your bride. Let us shine in a way that others will see a light and say, I need what you have. And Lord, that we would be bold, always ready to give an example for the life and the hope that we have through Jesus. Thank you. We praise you. And Lord, if I pray that if there's somebody listening to this, they don't know Jesus as their Savior, 
They don't know him as the groom. They don't even know what I'm talking about as being married and bride and all that. But Lord, they need to learn that they have to be born again. You have to be invited to the wedding. Lord, let us hear from them. Let us hear that they need that invitation. Let us be ready to present them with the invitation. Thank you that you give us that responsibility. Let us not take it lightly. Let us not understand that and then do nothing about it. Let us be faithful. Let us be partners. Let us feel your presence. And we ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Give them just a second. I